This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Leah Lazar to today's long table, number 205. Um, Leah is somebody I've known now for a number of years. She has been deeply involved in this change project, and this is a European Research Council multi-year project um, that is based at Oxford University, and she'll be telling you more about that today. But um, in the meantime, since uh, Leah has been working on this, she finished her PhD at Oxford and has published her first book, an absolutely wonderful study called Athenian Power in the Fifth Century, um, which came out earlier this year from Oxford University Press. Um, does include uh, some discussion of coinage, so would certainly recommend um, all of you take a look at that if you have interest in the classical period and the Athen Athenian action in the middle of or in the fifth century. Um, she also will be starting at the University of Manchester in January of this next year as a lecturer. So she'll be leaving Oxford's and moving north. And we'll see how that works out for her football teams and football supporting. So, so in the meantime, um, I'll turn it over to you, Leah, and you can uh, talk to us then about the Change Project. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Peter, and indeed for inviting me to speak today. It's a real honour. Um, I can confirm that I, I support Arsenal. I'm from North London, and that won't be changing when I move up to Manchester, uh, if that means anything to those of you in the States. Um, so as um, Peter mentioned, um, I'll be talking to you today about the Change Project. Um, and this is a collaborative project researching the monetary history of ancient Anatolia. So that's the region of modern day Turkey, as you can hopefully see in the map on my slide. First, I'll provide a brief introduction to the project as a whole and to the digital resources that we're creating, mostly because we hope that some of them might be of interest to some of you that you might even want to take a look and use them. And then for the greater part of my talk, I'll turn to my own work on the project in particular. I've been responsible for creating our digital resources concerning monetary circulation and use. So I'll take a closer look at the data sets that I've been responsible for, data sets of coin hoards and coins from archaeological excavations in Turkey. And I'll explore how we can begin to analyze big picture trends in monetary history using this data. So first, a further word on the change project. Uh, as Peter mentioned, this is a collaborative project funded by the European Research Council. And the principal investigator is Andrew Meadows, formerly of the American Numismatic Society. And the project brings together a research team in Oxford, uh, including me, with collaborators at the British Museum and at the Munz Cabinet in Berlin. And we're gathering both numismatic and documentary evidence for the monetary history of Anatolia, from the invention of coinage in the seventh century BCE, through to the absorption of the region by the Roman Empire in the first century BCE. And we hope that the creation of new digital tools will help to answer major questions about the economic history of Anatolia over time. So looking at the emergence of coinage, the introduction of fiduciary coinage and processes of monetization across different states, empires, subregions. The digital tools that we're creating can be divided into three key groups. So we're not just interested in coins on this project, as I said, we're also interested in inscriptions and documentary evidence concerning money and coinage. So that's the first category of, of tool that we're creating. And then we're looking at uh, numismatic evidence from different angles. So both at the production of coinage and also at the places that coinage, uh, the places that coinage are found, uh, the circulation and use of coinage. So a brief word on, uh, on our first tool um, concerning documentary evidence. And this has been the responsibility of my colleague in Oxford, Dr. Marcus Chin, 
who has had the an unenviable task of surveying all inscriptions produced in Anatolia from the Archaic period through to the Hellenistic, and thinking about how they talk about money, monetary behavior, and coinage. And he's categorized about 10,000 inscriptions from the region according to the kind of monetary behavior that they describe. And the point of this is so that we can think about how inscribed, um, what inscribed evidence can tell us about how money was used, what institutional contexts money and coinage operated in, and how documentary evidence intersects with numismatic evidence. And Marcus has created a really useful tool, which is actually now available online, available through the Change Project website. And I've given you a screen grab from this, uh, from this tool on the slide, just to give you a brief example of what you could do with this. Say you were interested in inscriptions that talk about the awarding of honorific crowns to prominent individuals. This was a really common behavior in the ancient Greek world when communities wanted to um, honor people. And it was a behavior that entailed the use of money and coinage. And Marcus has documented about 900 examples of inscriptions which talk about the award of honorific crowns to individuals from Anatolia. So I searched for this uh, in his database and this is what came up. Uh, and you can go through and look at the individual inscriptions. But the, uh, the tool also allows us to analyze this data on mass, and there's a mapping function built into the website. So here I've mapped all the instances uh, of inscriptions talking about honorific crowns from Anatolia. Uh, it's quite interesting. You can see there's a greater concentration geographically in the western part of the region. Uh, maybe not surprising because this is where we find more inscriptions in general in the more established Greek communities, which had uh, more prolific practices of inscribing. So that was just a really brief example. There's so much more that you can do with this tool, but I just wanted to flag it for those of you that might be interested. Moving on to our second category of digital tool at the Change Project. Uh, the tools concerning the production of coinage. And one of the key aims of the project was to produce a typology of all the coinage produced in Anatolia over time. So a description of all the types of coins minted. And this was the responsibility of our principal investigator, Andrew Meadows. And he has created uh, a typology of Anatolian coinage, which is available online, again, from our project website. And um, it covers most coinages from Anatolia, apart from those from the northwestern part of the region, from the Triad and Mysia, uh, for which a typology has been created by, by our colleagues at the Corpus Nemorum project in Berlin. Um, and of course, some royal coinages were also produced in the region, and they're included in the typologies uh, available through the Hellenistic Royal Coinages project at the ANS. But the beauty um, of all of these tools is that using a linked open data framework, they've been brought together under the umbrella of the ARCH project. That's a typology of all Greek coinage online. And the, um, the ARCH typology allows us now to have a really helpful overview of what co coinage was produced where and when, not just for Anatolia, but for many parts of the Greek world. And in a moment, I'll show you what we can do with that. But I should also um, briefly flag um, the work that's been going on in collections as part of the change project. Our colleagues in Berlin and at the British Museum have been digitizing their collections of Anatolian coins, making them available online and linking them in to the change typology. And uh, the collection at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris is already online, and we're also trying to link in the collections from Oxford and Copenhagen. And the idea is that the typology will be illustrated with lots of different specimens of actual coins, and that these large international collections will hopefully be representative 
of levels of ancient production. So um, if we have more specimens of a particular type of coin, perhaps that means that that type was produced more prolifically. So um, as I said before, just to give you um, a quick uh, look at what the arch typology actually looks like when applied to Anatolia. Here I've got a screen grab from the website, which you can visit, and I've searched for Miletus, an important city in Western Anatolia. And immediately um, I had been given 243 different types of coins produced at Miletus. And if I scroll through, I could have um, an overview of the entire history of minting in that city. Um, normally it sorts itself chronologically, but for some reason, um, when I searched a few days ago, um, it started off here with two types produced uh, under Antiochus II, uh, the Seleucid king that are listed in Seleucid coins online. And then um, you can see we move into uh, civic types produced at Miletus in the Archaic period. And these types are illustrated with images taken from the specimens contained in the collections. So hopefully that should be a really useful tool for those of you interested in Anatolian coinage, indeed in, um, in, in coinage from elsewhere in the Greek world. But the arch typology also allows analysis of data um, on a bigger scale. So just to give you a quick example, um, I'm interested in the spread of silver coinage in the archaic period, um, as I think Peter and other curators at the American Numismatic Society are. And just to give you example, an example, I quickly extracted information on what mints were operational in the archaic period from the arch typology, and I plotted them on a map so that we could see the spread of silver coinage over time. And on the slide, you can see a map um, of the mints that were producing coins uh, in the middle of the 6th century BCE, between the years 560 and 531. Um, and you can see at this point that uh, coinage had um, spread beyond its original, uh, its original home in Western Anatolia. Um, sorry, I should flag, and I should have flagged this earlier, the early electrum coinages are not yet in the arch typology. Um, I believe that Uta Wartenberg is working on them. Um, so we have incomplete data for the electrum coinages, but um, the early silver fall in there and plotted on this map. So we can see on this map that uh, we, the original home of, of, of coinage we're seeing some silver mints operational, but also silver coinage has begun to spread further than just Western Anatolia with coins being produced in mainland Greece and as far as Southern Italy. So that's the picture in the middle of the sixth century BCE, around the time that silver coinage was first introduced. Then by the end of the sixth century BC, we can see that many more mints across the Mediterranean and beyond were producing silver coinage, way beyond its original home in Western Anatolia. So lots of mints operational in the Aegean, in Northern Greece, in Southern Italy, in Sicily, and even as far as North Africa and the Black Sea. And then by the end of the Archaic period, in the years immediately preceding the Persian Wars and King Xerxes of Persia and his invasion of the Greek mainland, we can see that there are many, many more mints across the Mediterranean producing silver coinage. So we've seen a spread across this period. Um, you can see on the map great density of mints, particularly in the Aegean and southern Italy and Sicily. And um, while I can't go into this in great detail now, it seems that this really is connected with the escalation in naval warfare in advance of the Persian Wars, because many silver coinages were being produced to pay for fleets, to pay for rowers. So that was just a very brief example of how we can extract data from, from the typology um, in order to say something about the production of coinage on a big scale over a chronological span. On to the main content of my talk today, um, and the 
third category of data set that we're producing at the change project. So concerning um, the fine spots and the circulation and use of coins. And as I said before, this has been my main area of responsibility on the project. And I've been producing two distinct data sets um, concer uh, concerning circulation and use. Firstly, that concerning coin hoards. So groups of coins, mostly precious metal coins with intrinsic value, as I'll show you in a minute, buried in groups for safekeeping. And then the second data set is that concerning coins found in archaeological excavations in Turkey. And these were mostly lower value coins, small change, fiduciary coinage usually made out of bronze. So between these two data sets, we get a sense of the kind of coins that were considered suitable for storing wealth and the kinds of coins that were considered suitable for more everyday exchange, more everyday commercial transactions. And putting them together, we can ask where, when, and in what context coins were used and how coins moved around. So zooming in on the hoards data, data set, just to tell you how it is composed. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are aware that the ANS hosts a fantastic resource at coinhoards.org, um, a digital version of the records of over 2,000 hoards from across the ancient Greek world, as recorded in the seminal inventory of Greek coin hoards. For the change project, I've collated data on further um, 624 hordes, either from Anatolia itself or containing Anatolian coins, um, as recorded in the volumes of coin hordes, the volumes which came after the inventory of Greek coin hordes. And um, that data is pretty much ready to go. We're hoping that it will be pumped into coinhoards.org at some point in the not too distant future. And um, these records contain information on the fine spot of hoards, on their date of burial, on their contents, and also relevant bibliography. For my analysis today, looking at big trends in Anatolian monetary history, I've extracted around 600 hoards found just in the region of Anatolia, recorded both in the inventory of Greek coin hoards and in coin hoards. So just to show you what this data looks like from a chronological perspective, we can analyze how many hordes were buried in the region of Anatolia over time. Um, a bit of a health warning might be necessary here. As Uta, among others, um, have warned me, quite a lot of these publications of hordes um, need to be looked at again, particularly when it comes to the date, um, the dates of them. Um, chronologies being revised all the time, particularly for the archaic period. But nonetheless, I think when we take this big data set and break it down chronologically, there are still some interesting patterns to be observed. So on the slide, I've um, provided a bar plot of hordes buried in the region over time with the date of burial on the x-axis and the number of hordes on the y-axis. And you can see that they're peaks um, when more hordes are buried. And the dates of these peaks are quite interesting. We first get a peak in the early fifth century, coinciding with the buildup to the Persian Wars um, and uh, Xerxes' invasion of Greece. There's then um, a bit of a dip and a buildup again throughout the fourth century, culminating at the end of the fourth century with the conquest of the region by Alexander the Great and the subsequent wars among his successors. And then finally, um, we get a big peak again in the number of hordes buried uh, at the beginning of the first century BC, coinciding with um, the Mithridatic Wars, the big wars between Mithridates VI of Pontus and the Roman Empire. What's going on here? Well, it seems that there's a correlation between hordes being buried and periods of significant warfare, um, which has been observed for other regions in the ancient world. Um, during these periods um, of war, more coins would have been produced to pay for 
fleets. Um, as I mentioned a few moments ago with the buildup of silver coinage before the Persian Wars, um, coins would also be minted to pay for soldiers. And then um, as well as more coins being produced, hordes would have also been buried, um, hordes of coins would have also been buried in greater numbers for safekeeping due to the uncertainty of, of these periods of war. And unfortunately, uh, the owners would have perhaps been more unlikely to come back to dig them up afterwards. So uh, a relationship between, um, between hoarding and periods of war. We can also um, break this data down chronologically by the type of metal being hoarded. Um, you can see on the slide now, um, I've included metal on the plot. Um, purple represents electrum, and we can see um, in the years after the invention of coinage in the region in electrum, um, its early dominance in hoards. But by the time of the Persian Wars at the beginning of the fifth century, silver coinage was really dominant. Gold, never very common in hordes buried in Anatolia, but the biggest peak that we see uh, was around the time of um, Alexander when he was producing a fairly prolific gold coinage. Bronze, fiduciary coinage, um, we begin to see from the fourth century onwards and it becomes much more common in the course of the Hellenistic period, peaking in the first century when we know a lot more bronze coins were being produced, especially around the Mithridatic Wars. Interestingly, um, mixed hoards, so hoards of different kinds of metal, um, which uh, is represented on the plot in green, these mixed hoards are never specially common in Anatolia, suggesting that these different kinds of metal um, were mostly being used separately for different kinds of economic function. We can also break down this data geographically over time. So on the slide, you can see that I've plotted hordes in the region on a map by century. So the first map shows hordes buried in the sixth century. And you can see that um, there's a concentration of hordes in the Western part of the region around um, Lydia and Ionia, the parts of Anatolia where coinage was originally produced and used. Um, there are a few outliers, including some hordes in central Anatolia, which would have been part of the expanded empire of the Lydian kingdom in the sixth century. But really, at this point in the archaic period, this was a uh, predominantly a, a phenomenon of Western Anatolia. In the fifth century, we begin to see some more geographic spread, particularly along the southern coast of, of Anatolia, um, regions like, sorry, need to, there we go, regions like Lycia in this part of um, southwestern Anatolia began to use and hoard coinage um, really in, in the fifth century. And then in the fourth century, we see a massive explosion in the hoarding of coins, not just in terms of numbers, but also geographically with a lot more of Anatolia um, seeing coin hoards. And this was a process that started earlier in the fourth century, but as I said before, really coincides with the conquest of Alexander the Great, um, who came across Anatolia, raided the Persian treasuries and used the, um, the metal to mint coins to pay his troops. Um, and we see, uh, as a result, coins being used across much more of the region and being buried across much more of the region. This geographic spread across much of Anatolia is maintained in the third century BCE, um, although there are fewer numbers of hordes overall. And then by the end of the Hellenistic period, um, we're seeing coins spread even further across Anatolia. So I might flag, um, we have a concentration of hordes in northeastern Anatolia in the region of Pontus in the first century BCE. And this was a region which hadn't seen really high numbers of coins being used, coins being hoarded before the later Hellenistic period. But this coincides with the, uh, the reign of Mithridates and the Mithridatic Wars, which I, I referred to a moment ago. 
um, at this point, if I can change my slide, yes, um, I will bring in the second data set that I was talking about, that concerning coins from archaeological sites in Anatolia. And this data set, I, I'm happy to say, is actually now online for your use. Um, you can access it via our Change Project website in the link on the slide. And it consists of almost 10,000 coins dating uh, before 30 BCE, found um, within excavations, but excluding hordes, because um, hopefully these will be contained in the other data set. I have included some stray finds, uh, coins that have surfaced outside the context of formal excavations, and also coins deliberately buried in graves in funerary contexts, which don't count as hordes, but I guess um, were sort of governed by different anthrop anthropological factors than other kinds of finds. Um, I gathered this information from a big bibliographic tool. So I looked at many, many publications of, uh, of coins found in archaeological sites in Turkey, as well as university dissertations, um, and found relevant data in over 130 of them. Um, thanks here to, well, many colleagues, but especially Turkish colleagues who've been brilliant in terms of publishing data from archaeological sites and making it available. And I've collected data on the fine spot of coins, on their mints, on their types, linking into the arch typology, which I mentioned earlier, their dates of production, sometimes quite approximate because um, many of these coins are quite badly corroded. Uh, if there was any um, authority of these coins um, beyond the, the mint, uh, the metal and some basic information about the location within the archaeological site. Uh, ideally, it would have been great to have much more um, information on this, but for various reasons, not least the inconsistency of how these coins are published, um, it wasn't possible to do more for now. But the work is still ongoing, uh, not least because our Turkish colleagues are still just sending us loads of publications, which is great, um, more and more coins from, from sites coming out of Turkey. There are lots of reasons that we need to be careful with this data. Um, I don't think I can discuss this fully now, but I should flag that um, we can say when the coin a coin was produced, but we can't necessarily say how long it was being used for, how long it circulated for. Um, to have some idea on this front, we do need uh, goods uh, good information on the archaeolo archaeological context of the find, which sometimes we have, but sometimes we don't. Um, at the same time, though, I think there's lots of potential for uh, discussion of these of these archaeological finds, particularly when we look at them um, en masse with, with big data sets. So let me give you a bit of a sense of what I mean there. Uh, Oh, so I, I forgot I was going to show you this. So this is um, a screen grab of the actual tool that's available online now. And I should give a shout out to our developer in Oxford, Dr. Imran Asif, who created this tool and put it online. You can see that you can search the data set by uh, various different, um, different criteria. And there's uh, also an instantaneous mapping tool. Um, so you can see on the left hand side of the screen grab, um, there's a map of the different sites where these coins were found. And then on the right hand side, you've got the mints where the coins were produced and these maps will change as you, as you search the data set. So um, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the dates when these coins were produced, as I said um, before, not the dates when they were deposited, when they ceased being used. Um, most of the coins in this data set date from the later classical or the Hellenistic period, and really from the later Hellenistic period, when more bronze coins, more small change was being produced. The majority of the coins in this data set, completely unsurprisingly, are bronze, so fiduciary coins without intrinsic value. Um, these were the coins that were just in general use. 
and we're being, um, you know, we're being dropped accidentally rather than deliberately buried for safekeeping. But we do have um, some silver coins in the data set, although I should flag that many of them seem to come from funerary contexts. They were being deliberately buried in people's graves. Just to give you a comparison across the, um, the excavation coins and the hoards data sets of the kinds of metal that were being used, um, as you can see again in the pie chart on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, bronze completely dominant in the excavation data set. On the right-hand side of the slide, um, I've broken down the hoards by the kind of metal found in them. And as you can see, 75% of, of the hoards contained silver coins, but 16% of them did contain bronze. So it's not entirely true to say that these bronze fiduciary coins weren't being hoarded. Um, there are some instances, including very large hoards where uh, they were. Um, and I think these were often in contexts where silver coins weren't available. So bronze, coins were standing in for them and, um, and being used as a store of wealth. We can also compare um, where the coins in the two different data sets were coming from. So on the slide, I have mapped the mints, so the places of production of the coins found in hordes in Anatolia. Um, so we can see essentially where coins that were buried in Anatolia were traveling from. And you can see there's a real concentration from Anatolia itself, particularly from, again, the western part of the region. But we have coins coming from quite a lot further afield, um, including um, the Aegean and Greece, as you might imagine, also the Levantine coast, Cyprus. So some coins traveling very far before they ended up being buried in the ground in Anatolia. This is a map of the mints of the coins found in archaeological sites uh, in Anatolia. And you can see that the geographic distribution actually isn't all that different to that of the hordes. We still have the majority of the coins found on Anatolian sites coming from Anatolia itself. But the density of mints um, from beyond Anatolia is a lot less. Um, that said, we do have some coins coming from very far afield before popping up on archaeological sites in Turkey. And um, we even have a couple of coins possibly coming from Iconum in Afghanistan. Um, and the reason that um, coins were presumably traveling for the most part um, to a lesser extent uh, for excavation finds than for hoards is that these were the lower value coins therefore um, wouldn't have intrinsic value, would need to circulate closer to their place of production. Whereas um, the silver coins buried in hoards had intrinsic value and therefore could travel further. So just to kind of confirm um, a bit more empirically the impression of coins not traveling very far um, and then turning up on archeological sites, on the slide, I have plotted um, a scatter plot um, showing how far coins traveled over time before being um, before uh, being found on archaeological sites. Um, and the points indicate coins. The, the mean date of production is on the x-axis, and the distance in kilometers between the mint and the fine spot of the coin is on the y-axis. Um, and the advantage of such a scatter plot is that it gives an overall impression of the distances coins were traveling. Um, and we can see that the vast majority of coins found in Anatolia throughout the period that I'm looking at were not traveling very far. But there was considerable movement of coins beyond their place of origin within 500 kilometers and to a lesser extent within um, 1,000 kilometers. And a few coins were traveling even longer distances and more so over time. Um, again, I flagged that real outlier of a couple of coins coming from possibly from Iconum in Afghanistan. Um, so the overall takeaway, I think, from the scatter plot is that it is true that local coinage was mostly being used for everyday transactions in places in ancient Anatolia, but that bronze fiduciary coinage 
was traveling to some extent beyond the place where it was produced and was being used in other places. So we can't say that these coins were only being used in the places um, governed by the political authority which produced them. Um, we can also break down this kind of analysis on a more sub-regional basis in order to see differences in how coins were functioning in the monetary economy in different parts of Anatolia. So on the slide, I've um, generated a map of the mints of coins found in the region of Lycia in um, southwestern Anatolia, this kind of peninsula here. Um, the top right hand map just indicates the locations of those mints of, of the coins found there. The bottom map then uses a bubble um, to indicate the relative number of coins um, coming from that mint so that you can see the distribution more clearly. And it's clear that in Lycia, the majority of coins being used were coming um, from Lycia itself. Um, although also from some neighboring regions, um, particularly I think from the island of, of Rhodes, which briefly uh, controlled Lycia in the second century BCE. Um, and I can also plot this data on a scatter plot. And um, it shows again that um, the majority of coins coming to Lycia um, were being used in Lycia, I should say, were traveling fewer than 200 kilometers. And we see a particular concentration of this from the second century BC onwards, when there was a federal straight state in Lycia, the Lycian League, which was producing a very prolific bronze coinage, which was really widely used across different cities in Lycia. Interestingly, the picture is actually a bit different for the neighboring region of Pamphylia, um, just to the east in um, southern, southern Anatolia. And again, I've plotted the mints of coins found on sites in Pamphylia on two maps. On the left, you've got uh, just the locations of the mints. On the right, you have, um, again, bubbles with sizes indicating the relative numbers of coins from those mints. And um, again, we do see that most coins being used in Pamphylia were produced in Pamphylia. So this is the kind of everyday coins mostly do have a local origin, but we also see coins coming from across Anatolia. Um, and I should say there are also a few coins in the data set um, from the Ptolemaic Empire, although without identified mints. So there were certainly a few coins from, from Cyprus and Egypt in use in Pamphylia. Um, but what's interesting is we see a slightly wider geographic distribution of mints um, of coins turning up in, in, in Pamphylia across Anatolia than we did for neighboring Lycia. Um, you might be able to see there's a sort of a line of mints going up to the, the northwest on the map, um, up towards Pergamon and the Attalid Kingdom. And there's good evidence to show that there were trade links between the region of Pamphylia and the Attalid Kingdom in the Hellenistic period. And I think we're seeing the mints on the overland route between these two regions. Um, we're seeing these mints and their coins turning up in Pamphylia. Um, another interesting point is that Lycia, um, the region just to the west, is not well represented when it comes to coins in Pamphylia. That's because many Lycian coins were being produced just for local use, particularly those Lycian League bronzes that I mentioned a few moments ago. So Lycia had something of a closed monetary system and it didn't have much of an impact on the neighboring region of Pamphylia. Um, again, I've, I've produced a scatter plot to show how far coins were traveling before um, turning up on sites in, in Pamphylia. And we can see that the distribution um, mostly is of coins within 200 kilometers, but actually there's also some distribution um, higher up uh, the, the plot um, with coins traveling further than they did for Lycia. So I hope that more or less made sense. I guess what my take home point there was is that there are actually quite interesting differences in the way that coins were being used um, for you know, everyday transactions. 
in different sub-regions of Anatolia. And we see quite subtle differences, even in two, two places, Lycia and Pamphylia, right, right next to each other. And this data set hopefully will allow us to, uh, to analyze the nuances of these differences further. I want to finish by showing how this data set also allows more fine-grained analysis of particular sites. And I thought I'd talk briefly about a really interesting site from northeastern Turkey, which um, probably most of you haven't heard of, because I certainly hadn't heard of it before, before embarking on this work. Um, Olas Hoyuk, which is a small, small rural site um, in, in Pontus, um, certainly an agricultural settlement, also hosted a sanctuary and perhaps a garrison under Mithridates. And um, the map on the slide shows the, the, the mints of coins found at Olos Hoyuk. And you can see that there's an interestingly wide geographic spread. So returning to one of my scatter plots, we can break this down um, more, more closely and see how coins were coming into this, this small site. Um, I think I showed you um, on, the on, on a map of hordes um, a few moments ago that there weren't many hordes buried in this region of Pontus before the end of the Hellenistic period. This wasn't an area which enjoyed widespread use of coinage. It wasn't burying hordes um, before the end of, of the Hellenistic period. But if we analyze the data from Olis Hoyuk, we see that there's some coins um, coming into the site uh, at the end of the fourth century. And I think this can be associated with a bit of an influx of money during the uh, invasion of Alexander and the wars of his successors. So Alexander did have some kind of monetary impact on the region, even if we're not really seeing that to a great extent in the hoard record. The majority of other coins found at the site come from the later Hellenistic period. Um, and most of them are pretty local. They're not traveling very long distances to be there, but we have three coins from over two, almost 2000 kilometers away. The majority of coins from the site are bronzes produced under Mithridates VI, mostly from the most prolific mint um, uh, in Pontus at the time for bronze coinage, Amasis. But we do have three coins coming, three silver coins, I should say, coming all the way from Rome. And um, it's worth noting that there are a few other examples of Roman silver coinage from the vicinity of Olus Hoyuk, including from um, the nearby Amasia Museum. And this is really notable given how few Roman coins um, were, have been found in Anatolia more generally, um, as Lucia Carboni has discussed. So it's really interesting that we have this cluster of Roman coins in Pontus. And I think it has to have something to do, of course, with the Mithridatic Wars. These silver coins were perhaps being, perhaps being carried to the region by, by Roman troops. Um, so I think that um, that is it for today. Um, I hope to have given you a taste of what these bigger data sets can do um, in, in terms of elucidating high level monetary trends in monetary history in ancient Anatolia. There's certainly a lot more to be done, and I hope some of you might be interested in looking at the tools of the Change Project. And thank you all very much for listening. Leah, thank you very much. Um, and again, I really want to congratulate you and Marcus and Andy on um, all of the very hard work that has gone into building what I'm sure is going to prove to be a tremendously useful set of tools for um, digging into and further understanding monetary use in um, Anatolia in the years forward. Um, and um, also looking forward and forward to working with you further on getting your hoard data sets into coinhoards.org. So um, hopefully that'll happen yeah, perhaps by the end of the year, if not uh, early in 2025. So we're um, um, talking about that, um, in fact, this very afternoon, a little bit later. So. Um, 
Do we have any uh, questions? Um, I do see that there are a couple of questions in the uh, chat. Uh, Danny Wolf is is asking um, what evidence favors consistently appending fiduciary to the word bronze for the coinages of Anatolia. <clears throat> Um, it's a good question. I mean, essentially that um, bronze and I should say other base metal coinages because not not all fiduciary coinage from Anatolia was made in bronze. Um, some of the Pontic coinages that I was talking I was talking about also uh, made in in brass. Um, but essentially, it didn't have um, intrinsic value as gold or silver, and seems to have operated mostly to provide lower value, smaller denominations. Oh, very good. Um, and Mike Markovitz is, ask, is asking also in the chat, how do you handle coins attributed to quote unquote uncertain mints? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I didn't I didn't go into this, but really <laughs> um, for any of you who um, are used to working with excavation coins, really quite a lot of coins can't be attribu attributed. So quite a big chunk of the data set are just unidentified Hellenistic coins. <laughs> Um, so I think it's important, though, to acknowledge that these these coins are part of the data set and I've made the choice to include them um, and where some basic information can be provided, you know, a big chronological range, perhaps, or you know that they're a type of Alexander, but you don't know where they're from. Um, I think it's still good to provide that information for analysis. Yeah, indeed. It's a continually ongoing problem in all sorts of data sets. Any other questions from the audience? If you do, please raise your hand. Um, in fact, I, I do have a question about um, the ongoing um, nature of the project. Um, I, I know that you guys have uh, still another year roughly um, to finish things up. Um, um, so that um, will, I, I think, largely bring some of these data sets as to to a point of completion as much as as possible at that point. But then, um, are there plans for continuing to maintain and update uh, the data sets after um, that point of completion? You know, at least for the ERC funding uh, next year. Um, it's a great question, and well, it's one that we've obviously discussed with you, Peter, and I know that it's something that concerns you with your own um, digital resources at the ANS. Um, because, because the change project's operating within the institutional context of Oxford, we at least have some security for the resources that we create not disappearing as such, they will remain online. But in terms of keeping them updated and adding or updating information, um, that's that certainly um, less less certain. Uh, we have talked with Turkish colleagues about really handing over these resources to them because obviously they're the experts on the ground, and we're lucky to have access to institutional funding and to um, grants from you know the ERC in 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 Oxford. But but these resources really should be should be owned by scholars in Turkey. So that might be the, the future beyond the scope of the project. Yeah, very good. Any other questions? Uh, yes, can't see who that is. Oh, Alexander, yes, please go ahead. Hi, Leah, thank you. Uh, this is fascinating. Um, my question is whether with those kind of scatter plots and what you were saying with Pamphylia, do you get, have you run the data basically for the other end? I mean, does a center like Pergamon, which in the second century is presumably, we might imagine behaving in a kind of imperial way? I mean, do you see what we would think of as the politics of the period in the coin data from there, or have you not had a chance to look? So, hi, Alex. Sorry, do you mean, um, are we seeing a wide range of coins traveling to big centers like Pergamon? Something like that, and if so, is it particularly targeted in areas that were brought under, say, Pergamene domination after the Peace of Apamea, or does it not correlate so nicely with the politics or the history of the period? No, I think there certainly is some correlation. Um, 
I haven't really run the analysis on this yet, but Pergamine bronze coinage is really prolific in the data set and not just in Pergamon and Aeolus and its immediate environs or within the Attilid kingdom. Pergamine bronze travels a lot. So I think there's, there's certainly something to, to look at there. Um, and some of these big centers do also attract more coinage from elsewhere. As you might imagine, more people are, are traveling there, more people are bringing coins. Um, you can you can do a kind of comparison across different sites, and I haven't actually looked at this for Pergamon, although we do have a lot of uh, a lot of coins from Pergamon published. But um, other big centers like um, Cos, I've looked at, and many many mints represented in the coins found at Cos. So certainly, I think the phenomenon that you're talking about um, can be traced both in coins from these centers going elsewhere, and also from coins from elsewhere traveling to them. No, that's wonderful. It's a really nice um, resource to test our assumptions. So thanks for sharing it. So, uh, hi, Leah, by the way. Hi, uh, Leah. <laughs> I wanted to add an observation that really, uh, at the conference we had about, okay, so on the project, on change project uh, last month, I actually used a Leah database to track the movement of bronze. And, uh, and uh, what we noticed is that uh, there are very specific patterns. Uh, for example, uh, during the Mithridatic Wars, there are much, much, much tighter relationship between the administrative districts. So of course, for example, Pigamen coinage is usually goes to Sardis, for example, but there, there are a very, very clear patterns developing uh, over time, especially once the Romans get in. One thing I wanted, to, and this is one thing, and I have a question for Leah. Um, your incredibly valuable uh, uh, bibliography, an incredible valuable bibliography that you shared with us for the conference, is that online? Because- uh, uh, Yeah, there's, there's a, um, for the excavation coins, Yes, the excavation yeah. coins. Since there are all these new, uh, these new publications, perhaps they're not so widely known. So widely known, yeah. Um, yeah. So everything that's currently in the database that is a Zotero bibliography online, and um, we should be updating it again in the next few months, thanks to yeah Turkish colleagues who've been sending me all their PhD students' dissertations. So, um, yeah, obviously some of this material not widely known and. Again, I think we should give credit to how fantastic um, Turkish archaeologists and numismatists have been with publishing a lot of stuff. So, although it's made my job harder, but. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? If there are a good number of uh, comments, thanking you for a very clear and most interesting talk, very eloquent description of a very valuable numismatic online tool, et cetera. So, um, there are no other questions or comments, then again, would like to thank you very much, Leah, for a wonderful presentation. And, uh, and of course, best of luck in Manchester. So. Thank you so much for having me.